Hello and welcome to the Future Electronics and NXP Semiconductors joint webinar on upgrading your DSP to an ARM processor. We have two experts on the call, Marcello Marquis and Eduardo Montanez. I'm your host for the webinar, Roshnika Fernando from NXP Semiconductors. If you have any questions, please type them into the GoToWebinar panel as you follow along, and we will answer them live during a Q&A section at the end of the call. Also, for the folks joining from the Americas, we will give you an opportunity to sign up for a follow-up call to talk about your current design and how we can help you upgrade. So without further ado, let me hand it off to Marcello and Eduardo. Okay, hello everyone. Um, thank you for joining us today. I'm glad uh, you could join us uh, today for this presentation. Uh, I'm just going to talk a little bit about DSP versus ARM processors. Okay, my name is uh, Marcelo Marquez, and you know I have a background in audio. I was working for uh, one of the big audio companies, and you know I was a project manager, uh, but with a hardware background. So I was always looking for, you know, new platforms, new ways of uh, reducing costs and making products better and uh, in an easier way. And we have also Eduardo. Eduardo, you want to talk a little bit about you? Yeah, thank you, Marcelo. Uh, Eduardo Montañez here. Very excited about this topic. Been in the embedded uh, industry now for 20 years uh, with architecture background, uh, defining many, many microcontrollers. And I'm very excited about this topic now that we're combining not only the the MCU world, but the, the DSP world. And we have some very exciting products and solutions that we're going to share with you today in the Item X RT portfolio and the Item X 8M portfolio as well. Okay, thanks, Eduardo. Uh, okay, so what we're going to talk about today. So this presentation is not like full of details about the DSP architectures or ARM architectures is more like an overview and uh, why I think uh, ARM processors are a better choice for a long-term solution for your company that is doing some uh, DSP algorithms or products that have uh, some, some DSP. Uh, we're going to talk about an overview of the market conditions, okay, uh, where the DSPs are at, where the ARMs are at, uh, where they're going. We're gonna see some roadmaps from both sides. We're gonna see the NXP ARM families, so what NXP has available uh, in ARM core processors. We're gonna look into some product hardware architecture uh, and see how the NXP family will help you to reduce the number of uh, components on your uh, hardware platform. We're gonna look into some benchmarks, and I know uh, most of you are probably excited about uh, to see some, some of the numbers out there and how they compare to DSPs. Uh, we're gonna look into block diagrams from uh, the RT series, IMX8, uh, and also the Layerscape. Uh, Real-time processing, and that's probably one of the main questions you guys have. Uh, I guess we have a lot of uh, DSP engineers in here. And they're like, uh, okay, I want to see some real-time processing capabilities on this ARM core. So we're going to talk about that too. And we're also going to talk about some software, um, DSP algorithms, basically how can you port over your DSP algorithms to some ARM platforms and, you know, what I think it's the kind of the best way of doing that. All right. So let's see uh, where DSPs are at. So most companies have been using the same DSP on the same platform for multiple projects for low and high performance. And I, you know, I've seen this uh, across the board. Uh, people are using that same DSP that they started using 20 years ago, and they have some highly optimized code written for this DSP. And you know, because it's easier for them to just spin another product with that DSP. You know, they uh, even for products that are really small, they don't need a lot of DSP performance. They keep using the same over and over and over again because, you know, there's not a lot of uh, DSPs out there and the portability is not really good. Uh, the DSPs are restricted to a few suppliers. There is no portability. Yeah. So, you know, most of most of the DSP engineers are using uh, TI or analog devices or even the old NXP Freescale. So, you know, there's not a lot of choices and they have very particular architectures specific to each one of them. So you cannot port your code easily from one to the other. 
Uh, the roadmap and costs are not really improving over time. And you guys probably know that uh, if you look at the TI or uh, analog devices roadmap, they've been showing the same roadmap for the past like five years. And there is not really some big improvements and the cost is not going down. Uh, tools are not as sophisticated and mature as mainstream options um, and not fully featured. Yeah, so the tools for DSPs are not that great, as most of you know. Uh, and that's mainly because, you know, the amount of uh, people that they have allocated to develop those tools are very uh, small. Uh, it's, DSP is not a big market, so they're not going to get a lot of attention. They're not going to allocate a lot of resources to update those tools or make them better. Uh, and there is a picture of an old computer. So, you know, programming DSPs feels like programming an old computer. <laughs> Anyways, okay, so roadmap of analog devices. Uh, this is something I've seen for the past maybe six years. They had uh, the 21469 as the latest version, and they're like, okay, we're gonna come up with something in the future. And that it's been like that for the past many, many years. They came, came out with a five series right now, uh, but you know, it took them good five, six, seven, I, I can't remember when the 4869 uh, was released, but it was like long, long time ago. As And as you can see, the low cost is not checked. So, you know, they're gonna release something, but the cost is not gonna go down. Okay, let's uh, see where ARMs are at. So our MCUs and MPUs are getting massive adoption by all segments, and you know that. Uh, it's everywhere. IoT, uh, tablets, cell phones, small computers, uh, everything now is looking into ARM processors. Um, I was at the ARM uh, conference uh, two years ago, and they were talking about the trillion devices by 2022, I think, or something crazy like that. It's, it's just getting massive adoption everywhere. So uh, they're getting all the attention and then better tools, constant improvements, and better support. Of course, if everyone's using, everyone's going to be uh, putting their money into uh, developing better tools and improving those uh, platforms. Of course, the support's going to be bit much better too. They're not restricted to a few suppliers or families, uh, and they're easy portable. Yeah, so if you start using ARM processors for your DSP algorithms, you're not going to be restricted to analog devices or TI or Freescale. You can move around. If there is another supplier, there is cheaper, better, better uh, peripherals, you can always move. And the same with the family. NXP has uh, a big family of ARM processors that you can move up and down. A roadmap is constantly growing and their cost is being significantly reduced over time. Yeah, so because everyone is adopting, it gets into mass production, volumes are super high prices go down and uh, everyone start looking into it, more competition, uh, reduced price, and you know the roadmaps, they are growing every single day. Um, it's easier to find engineering resources, and this is really interesting because once you're developing your own DSP algorithms and you have a very particular uh, pr processor architecture, it's not easy to find a skilled engineer to, you know, optimize your code and actually deploy everything on, onto your platform. So it's way easier to find engineers that are more familiar with the MCU uh, architecture and, you know, tools. You get the benefit from the open source community and, you know, you have Linux, you have so many uh, VSP algorithms out there, uh, they're open source. Um, and that's gonna you, that's gonna benefit your your design. Uh, you have the drivers you can take advantage from. So many many things that are good from the open source community. Now let's see uh, the RT series roadmap from NXP and see uh, the prices and where they're at right now. And as you can see, they have a, a big line of uh, co-processors that's in between an MCU and a, and a real uh, processor. And it starts with the RT1010. As you can see, it's a 99, uh, 99 cents, 500 megahertz Cortex-M7 with a floating point unit. And then it goes up to the 1050, 
uh, to the 1050 uh, here, which is a 600 megahertz Cortex M7, which with a lot of more peripherals, it has LCP interface, uh, it has EMMC interface, it has a uh, dual uh, USB OTG port, which is very uh, useful if you're doing, for example, an audio interface, you want to stream audio over, uh, over USB to your computer. You can also enable MFI and stream that to your iPhone on the other port. So there are many possibilities here. The RT1060 uh, uh, has internal uh, memory, so internal RAM, one megabyte on the 1060, four megabytes on the uh, 1064. So uh, that's uh, that's really great because then you have that fast access to uh, RAM, which is going to help you with your DSP albums. And at the very top, you have the 1170, which which is a beast of an MCU because it's a one gigahertz Cortex M7 with a floating point unit. And I think it also has a M4 inside, so it's a, it's another processor. Yeah, Marcelo, if I can add, uh, yeah. one of the one of the key challenges that we saw in the market a couple of years ago with the introduction of this new portfolio in the Adam XRT was the need for even more performance uh, that a traditional MCU wouldn't be able to capture, but also being able to take the rich interfaces and, and capabilities that you get from an application processor and, and bring those together. That's where you have this kind of uh, large portfolio of MCUs where we can uh, showcase DSP-like capability and performance, but also have an MCU, very rich MCU integration, as you see with some of the IP that, that Marcelo has mentioned, um, and capping that off here at the end of this year with the RT1170 that, that just uh, goes well beyond any capabilities of an MCU out in the market, uh, being able to do very rich DSP uh, computation. I did want to talk about an additional product here on the that we have here in green at the top. So we see two different personas in, in development. Obviously, some of you might be coming from a strictly DSP world where uh, you're writing code for that DSP and now you're looking for uh, something that's going to combine not only the DSP functionality in your system, but also the MCU functionality. Uh, then there's also a persona that requires just to get get audio or voice processing of a DSP quickly into their end product. And we've just introduced a product, the RT600, that does just that. It takes a, again, another high performance ARM Cortex M33 core, but adds a, a Cadence Tensilica Hi-5 4 DSP that runs up to 600 megahertz. So you kind of get the best of both worlds. That product is really more intended at someone who wants to take one of our NXP or partner solutions, software solutions, and plug it in uh, and run on that DSP uh, quite, uh, you know, quite efficiently. So, so again, you have the high performance of the RT 1000s for that DSP activity, or you have the RT 600 now that still has a DSP in it and allows you to do the MCU functionality in the M33 and quickly take our software solutions or our partner solutions to, to quickly add voice processing or audio processing or ML and AI processing as well. So thank you, Marcelo. Just wanted to kind of add a little color to the RT portfolio and how it fits in this topic. Sure, no problem. So uh, the price for the 11.7 here, correct me if I'm wrong, Eduardo, but it's around $5, correct? Yeah, that's correct. It'll be starting around five dollars. So it's a it's a beast of an MCU at a very good cost of entry. And something to note is that all these devices uh, have it built in power management. Uh, so no external PMIX needed. We design our our packages to be simply laid out in uh, four layer PCB uh, for the for the BGAs and so forth. So it's very easy to design and we provide SDK and IDE solutions to to get started quickly. Right, and I'm back to the uh, RT600 and 500 series that, ha that have a uh, DSP inside, the 10 silica DSP. Now, it goes back to the question, that's a specific architecture, DSP architecture. Um, you're not gonna write your code to it and get stuck. I think this is more like, as Eduardo said, it's more for the persona who wants to deploy some uh, ready-to-go DSP algorithms like uh, noise cancellation, those kind of things are available for this platform, and you just mm -hmm. want Please spin out a product. 
But for those who are writing their own DSP code and they're optimizing their code and just they just want to um, find a, a good platform, then look into only processors because then you can move up and down and you can uh, you're not going to get stuck. Um, as you can see, the roadmap from from uh, is growing and it's growing really really fast. Okay, so that's another uh, evidence that ARM processors are going to be around for many many years and they're going to get improved over time and the cost is going to go down like 500 megahertz cortex m7 with a floating point for a dollar that's uh, that's pretty incredible yeah and 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 not to be um dismissed but we'll continue to look at obviously additional pieces of the system that will be integrated into that portfolio when you're talking about wireless connectivity uh, you're looking at richer displays um, and, and so forth. So, so this is kind of pulling in the different bomb components in your system and simplifying that design, simplifying the software solution, and obviously uh, reducing the cost. Right. Okay. And the roadmap is, is growing. Uh, all right. Development challenge. Um, so because I'm, I have this uh, audio background, I talk a lot about audio, but you know, that also applies for video products. But, you know, the complexity of audio and video products is increasing, so they're getting more complicated and lower bomb costs are required. There's more competition, more people in the market. Uh, deployment times are shrinking, so you've got to be fast. More connectivity is required. There is IoT, you know, everyone wants to connect to a computer, to a phone, uh, wireless, Bluetooth, and all kind of stuff. Uh, so that's another requirement. Engineering resources are hard to find, especially for those that are writing their own DSP algorithms. Third-party IP integration. So there are a lot of uh, companies out there doing some uh, DSP algorithms, and you know you might as well want to integrate them into your uh, embedded system. Uh, and also, like if you have written your DSP algorithm for one of these ARM processors, it's really easy to port over to a computer or a phone. You know, every phone is using an ARM processor right now. Size and power requirements, mobile application security. Uh, so yes, ARM processors, because they have a smaller uh, node technology, it's uh, going down here, you can see it's at uh, 40 nanometers, but it's uh, going down uh, to 14 nanometers on the uh, A4s, and eventually it's gonna get to the five nanometers uh, node technology. So the power is gonna be uh, way lower, and that enables you to do, uh, you know, some sort of mobile product. Uh, security is a big topic. We can uh, discuss that later. But you know, uh, ARM processors they have a lot of uh, security uh, features to protect your code. Okay, so what an XP can offer uh, in terms of ARM processors? As you can see, they move from a crossover processor to the very top high-end layerscape series. So we have the RT series with an M7 floating point, and there is a range from 500 megahertz to one gigahertz, and those are running RTOS. I'm gonna talk about real-time uh, OS uh, later, so this is just a, a quick introduction. The IMX8 Mini and Nano, which I'm gonna be focusing right now because they're you know the, the uh, more affordable versions of the IMX8 series, they range from one to to four cores, A53 with the NEO instructions, uh, 1.5 gigahertz to 1.8 gigahertz. Again, they come with a Yocto Linux. And I'm gonna talk about this little kernel RTOS, which is something new that NXP is uh, going to release uh, maybe you know uh, this year, we'll see. Layerscape series, they range from a one core to 16 cores, uh, from an A53 to A72 with NEO instructions, one gigahertz to 2.2 gigahertz. And this one has more real-time capabilities at the moment. So they have a Xenomai Mercury, they have Xenomai Cobalt, which is an RTOS, a Linux, and Burr Metal Framework as well. Okay, let's move to the all-in-one solution. So uh, if there are Many audio customers here. Uh, if you're developing audio interfaces, guitar pedals, guitar processors, those kind of things, you're probably familiar with this kind of architecture where you use a DSP Shark, an MCU to control your UI, maybe an LCD display, and then you use the XMOS for streaming audio over USB. 
you know that's a very uh, common platform uh, on the auto industry now you can shrink that down to one or t1050 uh, uh, processor because uh, it has DSP capabilities it has uh, the USB ports uh, and their OTG so you can stream audio to a computer or to a phone and you can also use uh, the the processor to do some uh, you know control and logic uh, uh, operations which the DSPs are not so good at. Um, so highly integrated audio DSP platform using the IMX or TMC Express with your TOS includes uh, driving touch screen LCD DSP effect chains peripherals, USB auto clash 2.0 device framework. This is something that NXP is improving, but there are also some companies out there that will provide you um, some enablement with a USB auto clash 2.0 connecting to a computer and streaming um, multi-track um, audio bi-directional okay so now let's look into the benchmarks and this is something most of you are um, waiting for so here we have three tables so the first one is normalized per clock cycle okay of uh, M4 core M7 A53 4 cores A53 Blackfin 5 series Blackfin 7 series and the Shark 21489 so this one is normalized. So this one is the uh, reference. And then as you can see, for the M4, it's not really quite there for FIR, bipod, and FFT. It's like 0.21 FIRs compared to a shark. And then the M7, you know, you can see a huge improvement, because, mostly because of the floating point unit and the higher clock speed. And then on the A53, which is uh, available on the IMX8, then you can see a lot of improvements here, like one core A53 for FIR is almost identical to a Shark 489. And by quads and FFT, it's a little behind, but it has four cores. And remember, this is per clock cycle. This one runs at 450 megahertz. This one is running at 1.5 gigahertz on the Nano and 1.8 gigahertz on the Mini. So now, and go to the second table uh, which is normalized per part now i'm taking in consideration here the clock speed of each one of them so the rt1010 500 megahertz you see it's kind of a third of a shark but remember this is a dollar this here nine bucks around nine bucks depending on the quantities you can get it for eight ten it, it varies um the rt1050 600 megahertz so Go, going up on the M series and then on the A53, you get one core at 1.5 gigahertz for bi quads, for example. You know, if you're doing a lot of equalizer filters, those kind of things, uh, it's twice as powerful as a shark per core. And you have four cores, so it's eight times better than a shark. Okay. And if you compare it to the Black Fin 5 series and 7 series, it's just there is no comparison. They are much, much better. Even these, the little 1010 is better than the 5 Series of Blackfin. Oh, sorry. Okay, so now I have the third table, which is a normalized performance per dollar. Okay. That is considering the shark being like you're paying nine bucks for the performance of 489, what you get with the others. So with the 1010, you get three times the performance per dollars if you're doing FIRs. 2.8 for bi and 1.7 for FFTs. And the number goes up if you move up with the clock speed, of course. But if you look into the Nano, one core of the Nano is already like four times better for FIRs in terms of performance per dollar compared to the Shark. And if you consider all the four clocks, it's, it's unbelievable. The performance you get out of the Nano is really, really good. And also remember, you get the benefit of having all the peripherals around the uh, the RT series and the IMX8 Nano. They're not present on the DSP devices, so you don't need the MCU, you don't need the XMOS, and then you're saving even more money here. These numbers, if you're asking where I get them from, uh, I've worked with a lot of customers, uh, my previous company, and we did some benchmarks for this three FIR, Biquad, and FFTs. And this is a kind of a rough estimation. 
with some optimization, of course, this is using some neo instructions. You know, you can get the idea where uh, they are at and how much processing you can get out of each one of them. Okay. Yeah, I and think that's the exact point, Marcelo, is the, the scalability that you get from a portfolio, uh, like shown here from NXP with the Atom XRT or the Atom X8, 8M. Um, you can really pick and choose the DSP performance level that you need to achieve with these ARM Cortex um, processors or also the variation of uh, in integration. Uh, I know we're going to talk here in the next few slides about uh, some of the Atom XRT and Atom X8 uh, products and their capabilities um, and, and within. So, so you can think about more of that system at a, at a better value and with a variation of performance. Okay. Okay, so I'll let Eduardo now talk a little bit about the RT series. So go ahead, Eduardo. Yeah, absolutely. So what we're looking at here is what we'd call the superset of the crossover microcontroller portfolio, the RT1170, uh, which has actually a, a Cortex M7 that can run up to one gigahertz and a variant that also includes a, a coprocessor, a Cortex M4, that can run up to 400 megahertz. Uh, this system really uh, does what a DSP uh, kind of falls short of, which is do more than just the DSP performance, but also adds uh, plenty of IP or peripherals here uh, for the for the end application. You can see uh, from the different categories, there's many connectivity uh, peripherals, inclu including uh, for some of the audio processing, you know, rich I squared S and SAI IP, um, as well. We have uh, eight channel digital microphone input as well on this product. Uh, we talked about USB, high speed, uh, 2.0. Um, but, but one point that, that we don't skimp on uh, with any of these MCUs is security. So that's a, obviously a growing growing need in the market. And this product uh, you know, will include secure boot, uh, on the fly, uh, decryption of external memory, interfaces, um, uh, storage for keys, and, and so forth. And also, um, for for those applications that have rich HMI, this product adds, uh, you know, parallel camera, parallel display interface, also has MIPI camera, MIPI display, and even a 2D graphics engine with a vector graphics acceleration. So plenty of capability beyond the DSP processing uh, with this RT1170. And the rest of the RT portfolio. Right. And also, uh, it's really good to mention on you know, the connectivity. You see the synchronous sample rate converter. So, for those uh, audio guys out there, uh, it's in hardware enabled on this platform here on this chip. So, yeah, that's very good point. Really good for uh, DSP audio processing. Uh, the SAI ports, it has a four lanes here, and I believe each lane can carry 32 channels, 32-bit, uh, uh, at 96 kilohertz at least. Um, you know, the as Eduardo said, you have the benefit of the multimedia interface with uh, the display interface in parallel LCD and the MIPI interface as well. You have the hyper-ran and, and hyper-flash capabilities, which uh, NXP has something called executing place. So you can execute your application inside the flash. Uh, so you don't have to transfer that over to the internal memory, uh, to the SD RAM, to the SRAM. And it's much faster interface than if you put in an external uh, legacy SD RAM. Okay. Yeah, so, so that wraps up the RT1170. I think the next, uh, if we can move to the RT 600 and 500. So at the beginning of our portfolio discussion on the RT, I talked about a new type of product in the Atom XRT crossover MCUs. Uh, we just recently launched the RT 600 in late February, and we're gonna launch the RT 500 in late July. Uh, this new portfolio of Cortex M33 has high performance uh, execution here with a 300 megahertz score, but it has a built-in DSP. So if you're, application requires uh, you know a full-blown DSP we have a, a combination here of uh, arm cortex m33 and a cadence and silica hi-fi 4 DSP that has a uh, four 32-bit uh, max 
uh, built in. So you have uh, obviously the enablement that comes around this product will include partner solutions that uh, help with beam forming, with uh, acoustic echo cancellation, with wake word engines, uh, with uh, voice uh, voice recognition, local command sets, and so forth. So uh, you can you can pick up you know even just basic nature DSP library uh, and and execute those DSP algorithms on the on the HiFi four in this product. And it, and it doesn't go without mentioning that this product still has quite a significant amount of IP uh, for the audio. Uh, equation. So here we have also uh, digital mic microphone with eight channels. We have several I squared S interfaces um, and so forth. So this uh, this product kind of tackles a different um, a different use case here, where uh, we have solutions uh, ready to go to to execute uh, audio, voice, or ML processing very quickly. Here's just an example of the type of performance you'll get from the HiFi 4 DSP uh, versus the Cor Cortex M33. So obviously, uh, Marcelo showed you the benchmarks of the Cortex M4, which is very much like the Cortex M33. That's kind of the evolution of the M4. Um, but I wanted to show even the next step up here of the HiFi 4 DSP. So you can see running FFTs, you can get eight to 26 times um, better performance uh, by leaving those kind of algorithms to the HiFi 4. Okay. Yeah, but remember, again, this is a um, specific uh, uh, DSP architecture. And uh, if you're not interested in uh, writing your algorithms to that platform, you, you just use ARM processors. Okay. So let's talk about real-time processing now, uh, which is something that the is a requirement for the audio industry. I know for sure uh, for the, the video, uh, I, I'm not really sure, I'm not really familiar, but with the RT1050, it runs free RTOS, deterministic OS, no problems with latency, um, you know, you have control over all the low-level drivers, so this is a no-brainer. Uh, you can just go ahead with it, you're not going to have any latency problems. Now, let's talk about the layerscape, and the layerscape is really interesting because it's more focused for automation, and uh, and because of that, it has a lot of uh, real-time capabilities. So it comes with uh, the Xenomai Mercury with the preempt RT patch uh, installed, and that's going to give you some more deterministic uh, capabilities for servicing interrupts. And this is going to give you better control over your latency and and the low-level drivers. Uh, the interesting thing about the Open Industrial Linux is that it also works as a hypervisor where you can put it on, on the, in one of the cores and then you enable RTOS or bare metal on the other cores. And then so let's say you have a platform where you uh, want to control the UI and control the drivers and all those things with the Linux. You just leave one core dedicated for that and then for your DSP algorithm you can just use the other cores and then you achieve the low latency uh, you know, that is desired by the audio industry, which is, which is really good. So talking about the Xenomic Cobalt, which is a real-time co kernel, this is the latency that you get for servicing interrupts. Um, here is a distribution of this uh, latency. And for the max latency, you get 680 nanoseconds. And that's the number that you know, we should be looking at. Uh, that's for servicing interrupts, and this is really, really good. Okay, so the cheap one, the IMX Mini and Nano, the $7 part with a four core A53 at 1.5 gigahertz. How are you going to get uh, real time on this uh, part? So NXP actually has um, you know, a hypervisor called Jailhouse running along with the little kernel, which is an RTOS system, on this part. The problem is uh, they are not releasing this yet because it has some proprietary IP inside that they're working with another customer. It has Adobe and 3D immersive uh, libraries, which they can't uh, uh, share. 
So they are working on removing those to release to the, the public. And what you can do with the little kernel, you can run that in one core, two, three, or on all four cores. It boots itself uh, if you're using the four cores. And then what you can do is use the Cortex-M7 to send some instructions to the A core uh, to tell it what to do, like, you know, what to process. Or you just leave one of the cores running the Linux jailhouse and, you know, that, you know, enables you with the full working uh, platform. Um, the interesting thing about the Nano is that it has here, as you can see, 10 lanes each way. So, you know, it can have up to 320 audio channels in and 300 audio channels out of this, uh, of this device. It has all the display interface, asynchronous sample rate convert, converter. Uh, it has uh, USB OTG ports. It has eMMC uh, uh, external access. So you can, you know, do a record your audio or video on this uh, eMMC. You can have SD card. You, you know, there's so many possibilities in just one card for seven dollars. It's really unbelievable. And with the little kernel. You don't have to worry about latency anymore. Latency is going to be uh, close to zero. Okay, Dante. So Dante just announced that they're going to be enabling the IMX8 Mini and Nano with their IP. And by doing so, you don't need to have that FPGA in between your processor or DSP and your uh, Dante connectivity. So you can use the IMX right away just deploy the Dante IP in there and then that's going to enable you uh, with uh, some some Dante channels here is some latency that they measured so if you're just using one of the cores of the IMX 8 mini you get 32 by 32 channels at 4 millisecond latency and then if you use more cores then you get more channels and you reduce the latency as well I don't know if I don't know if they tested with the four cores. I don't know the reason why, but these are the numbers that I got from uh, Audinate. So uh, they are probably going to release some more information uh, because now it's like this is this is pretty new. And okay, so let's say you have a platform. You need Dante. You need 32 by 32 channels. Four milliseconds is good enough. You want to do some DSP processing. You want to control the UI with an IMX8 Nano. That that's possible with only one part so look at the amount of cost reduction you have uh, by just using this this uh, IMX uh, success case so this is one that proves that it's possible to use the IMX uh, 8 nano as a DSP processor with ultra low latency uh, soundbars so there is a big company out there I cannot mention the name uh, unless the other one should talk about it but they are already using the IMX8 uh, Mini or Nano. I don't know exactly which one. I think it's a Nano. They're doing some DSP processing. They're doing the doubly digital through the immersive uh, decompression using the uh, the A cores inside Little Kernel and Jailhouse. And why do they need low latency? Just because of gaming. Because if you're playing a video game. Uh, the audio to respond with the low latency to your commands on your controller right and that's the only reason why you need super low latency uh, and that's out there if you buy one of the sound bars open it up you're gonna see the IMX in there um, okay yeah I'll also like to add real quick uh, Marcelo that on the RT which we discussed earlier we've had a, a great success pulling in not only the DSP but uh, the MCU functionality of some audio equipment. Uh, that's been that's been a good success. And now with the introduction of products like the RT600, RT500, we're seeing a lot of interest and success in, in development for uh, the wearable market, uh, headphones, uh, smart speakers, and so forth. Right. And also there are other success cases like uh, in my case here, we did a few products using the RT series running DSP algorithms. And, you know, it was uh, really uh, successful because uh, it proved to be a very powerful DSP processor for the price. And, you know, uh, for guitar pedals, for, you know, little vocal processors, 
uh, there are some companies looking into uh, using the IMX8 uh, inside mixers uh, with a high channel count. So, you know, we can kind of see the industry is moving in that direction. Uh, and now NXP is kind of uh, looking into that and trying to make the tools and making uh, the platform more uh, audio friendly. Let's put it that way, or DSP friendly. Okay, so software. How would you move your code over to an ARM core? And this is, you know, I've been talking to a lot of uh, DSP engineers and, you know, the main concern that they have is, okay, so I wrote all my code, maybe in C, and then I did a lot of optimization to the, uh, to the sharp architecture. And now uh, there's a bunch of assembly code in, in, in my, my code base. So how, how do, I, do I move to an ARM processor? So this is this is how I see them doing. Like they write a very structured code in generic C and C++, and um, so they basically get the, their algorithms. You start with the plain C C++, and they move to optimization. They start looking into some libraries that have some uh, DSP uh, math, uh, you know, functions. For example, FFTs. Uh, and for the M course, you have this uh, CMC's uh, library. And inside the, this library, you can find a lot of those uh, most used DSP uh, functions. And also there's the NE10 for the uh, ARM8 course. Uh, this library is using NEO instructions. So, you know, if you're using an, uh, an A core with NEON, you can use that library, take advantage of it and then do some optimization and it can make a huge difference, okay, if you're using uh, some new instructions. Then what you can do is uh, you can profile your code, look where, you can, look where it can be optimized, like normally you're going to see the low hanging fruit where, you know, you see, oh, with the, just a little bit of optimization here, I'm going to get a huge benefit of this uh, uh, new instructions. So you're using Trinsics, target some instructions, and then uh, you're going to have much more performance out of the A core. And then after all that, you know, you just go into assembly code. And then you probably ask me, okay, so now I'm stuck back into uh, uh, one platform. I'm back into that dilemma where uh, I have a DSP fully optimized and I cannot move anymore. Well, in this case, you know, ARM processors are gonna be around. They're gonna be faster. Neo instructions is gonna be present on most of them. And the, if you do it this way, a very structured code, you do some compile conditioning where, you know, start with C and then you, you know, put some conditions to use the libraries or the intrinsics, you can move up and down and then you can build a code base full of a DSP algorithms where depending on the platform you're going to deploy, you just compile it like differently. So you have plenty of room to move uh, into a very small platform that uses Maybe just one of one DSP algorithm to you know a fully um, you know let's say a guitar processor that has tons of DSP processing and tons of DSP algorithms. So that's the advantage. And if you're looking forward, if you're looking at your company in five to ten years, uh, are you going to be really using ARMs? They're getting expensive and it's really hard to uh, get out of them. Or are you going to be start thinking about porting your algorithms to something that is more portable and that can be deployed on a phone or on a computer. And that's kind of the question that you have to ask yourself. You think ARM processors are going to get cheaper and they're going to get faster and they're good enough to run DSP algorithms, then you know you should be thinking about moving your code base into ARMs right now. But if you think DSPs are good enough and you can get away with them, then you know I, there's nothing I can do to convince you. But, you know, there are options out there. So that being said, uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for your time. We did it in 45 uh, minutes, uh, which is pretty good. So we have 15 minutes for questions, if there are any questions. And if you really want to get to a, a, a discussion with me about, you know, how I did in my previous company and what are the challenges, uh, you know, we can always contact me. Uh, Rush is going to follow up with, um, who, who wants to do a, you know, a follow-up on this. And likewise, if you'd like to learn more about the types of uh, 
microcontrollers and application processors that we talked about it from NXP today. Um, we're more than happy to, to have um, more of a one-on-one -on -one discussion on your particular needs and, and what type of product can address them. All right, thank you so much. And if you have any questions, I think you can just write uh, on the chat and then Rosh is gonna read them. Yes, we do have a bunch of questions for you. <laughs> and, you know, everyone can see the poll on their screen right now. So just, you know, hit yes if you'd like to have a follow-up call. And I'll leave it open as we uh, read through some of the questions that came in. How can I read the questions? I don't see I, them. I'll read them up to you. Okay. Yeah. So first, okay, we have so many. The first is, um, is the IMAX RT robust enough for motor control applications, UPS, solar inverters, any other kind of power electronics in general? So Eduardo, do you wanna, you wanna answer that one? Cause I think you, you know more about these applications than I do. Yeah, absolutely. We've had, uh, we've had quite the success in the industrial space with the IMAX RT. Um, the timers and analog on these MCUs really are allow you to support those those types of applications. So we've had success in in all those mentioned there. Um, that's definitely something that we can have further discussions with you about if you'd like to explore how that product can fit into to that space. Yeah, just adding a little bit to that question, I, I think he's asking robustness in terms of uh, really trust is going to be processing all like. Uh, without interrupts and I think he has, he runs our toss. Yeah, have definitely, you know, code. being that yeah. these are all de deterministic MCUs, uh, you have that, that level of robustness. Now, uh, I've also, I mean, you could take this question many different ways. We've had a uh, request for ECC in the on-chip RAM as well, and we're going to introduce that with the RT1170. Uh, so there's different levels of robustness that, that we do take into account when when playing in these application spaces. Yeah, and just so you know, I have one one of my customers actually using one of these ARM processors for, uh, like instead of those TI Piccolo DSPs for um, motor control. So, you know, that's uh, proven to be successful. Okay, next question. Marcelo, this one's for you, and I'm combining two questions into one. And you have to give the the 2,000 foot view of this. So, how do you compare um, the the microcontrollers and processors you talked now? Like, how do they compare versus TI DSPs or ADI DSPs? Okay, so this is this is what I have uh, in terms of comparison. Like, if you're talking strictly DSP, uh, you know they. If you compare one to one, maybe some of them are not quite there yet. So the RT series, as you can see, they are a little bit far behind, you know, the Shark DSPs. For the TIs, I don't have the numbers because, uh, to be honest with you, I didn't deal too much with the TI DSPs, but I know they're pretty close to the Sharks in terms of like, speed and also the instructions, accelerators that they have and all kinds of things. So I would say TI is probably close to this number here. You can just grab the TI clock speed and then compare to this and you're gonna have your, your answer. Uh, but if you look into the nano, now moving forward with the 1.5 gigahertz, and even if you look at the layer scape at 2.2 gigahertz, I would say it's much better than a Shark or a TI DSP at this point. Uh, of course, there's some advantage of the, the Sharks uh, in terms of, um, like, if you have your code base written for Shark, it's, you know, it's easy to reuse uh, a DSP, but in terms of performance and performance per dollar, there is no comparison. There is no comparison at all. I think, I, I hope I answered your question, but we can, you know, we can do a follow-up. We can discuss that uh, even more if you want. Fantastic. A question for you, Eduardo. Is the IDOTMX a Hi-Fi 4 DSP C programmable? And where can we get information about its instruction set and development tools? 
Yes, that's correct. It is, and we have uh, available and licensed for our RT600 uh, customers the uh, full cadence and silica uh, explorer development tools. So that's a uh, that's an avenue for development for that HiFi4 DSP. Alongside with that, we have um, the Extensa audio framework in our RT600 uh, SDK. We've also licensed several uh, codecs, uh, many of the ones that that are popular. So we have those uh, royalty free and available for for use on the RT600. All right, great. Um, and this is a question Eduardo or Marcelo, either of you can answer. Uh, but a lot of folks have been asking, how do they get a hold of these um, these IDMX RT MCUs or the IDMX ADEM and ADEM Mini uh, MPUs in terms of the eval boards and the software? So how can they? Yeah, get that? yeah, excellent question. I can address this one. So. Every single product we put out in not just the not just the hardware but but the software, uh, we have uh, product pages on the particular devices that that we talked about today. So if you want to go learn more about the Item XRT uh, family, you can go to nxp.com forward slash IMXRT, and then you'll see the lineup of the portfolio, and then you can click around on which particular product. We I think the entry page just shows. Um, the product selection, like what the different functionality differences are between uh, the various different devices in the portfolio, and the same would apply for item x 8 m And from within those product pages, we have um, the documentation, uh, user manual, data sheets, application notes, uh, the EVK uh, page that you can order from, and um, and, and much more information. So that would be kind of the first step. Obviously, we've, we're offering here the opportunity to have uh, more of a personalized discussion with you. If you want to learn more about a particular device, we can we can give you more details. Yeah, and also if you if you working with Future Electronics, just ask your uh, sales manager uh, for EVKs. Uh, sometimes they can uh, give you one. So that's another tip for you guys to get one for free. Free is always good. <laughs> Free is always good. And I think there's also a discount uh, code that is available right now where you get the DVK for 50% discount. But you gotta, again, you gotta ask your sales manager at Future. But I heard of that. Yes, if you wanna get a 50% discount, you should talk to your sales manager at Future. Absolutely. Uh, question for you, Marcelo. Uh, regarding the IDOMX platforms you talked about, what is the benefit of using Linux or not using Linux? Okay, so the benefit of, okay, so if you're talking just DSP, so let's go to this slide here. Where is it? Where is it? Okay, so if you're talking just DSP processing, okay, when you use Linux, it's a non deterministic uh, system. What that means is that you don't know how Linux is going to prioritize your interrupt to grab the audio frame and start processing. So you don't have control over that with plain Linux, okay? Uh, and what that's going to give you is a latency that is not deterministic. You cannot predict how much your latency is going to be. Let's say you have uh, one example, the TAR processor. It has a big display with the UI. And then you're using the UI, you're using Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, whatever. So Linux is taking care of all of that. And at the same time, it's processing your audio. Even if you prioritize the thread that is doing the DSP processing, you don't have fully control over the system. And that's the disadvantage of Linux. That's why most of these companies, what they really want is, okay, I want my audio frame, as soon as it gets into the, the, the processor, I want it to be processed and get out uh, at uh, the, the shortest possible period of time. So that's why they require some RTOS uh, OSs. The RTOS is scheduled, so you have control over that, okay? The other thing about Linux is that there is a, this pre, you see the preempt RT patch here? For the layer scape that is already present on the Mer Mercury Linux, and the preempt makes your system printable, which means you can schedule your interrupts, and that gives you a little bit more control over your latency. For the IMX8, 
Okay, and I think that's a really important topic. The little kernel is the RCOS, right? But that's going to be available this year. I have one customer that is using the IMX8 Mi, uh, Nano and Mini with the Yocto Linux, and they install the RT preempt patch themselves, and then they got super low latency on the audio processing. I think with the codex and everything on top of that, it was around like three milliseconds. Sorry, Marcel. We, we can go lower than that. We can't see your screen. I think you need to hit play to present again. Okay, let's stop. Show. Can you see? Oh, no. I'm sorry. I can't get this poll to, to go away. Oh, no. Here we are. We're back. Thank you. We're back. Yeah, it's okay. coming up. It's coming up now, Marcel. I can see it. Okay, good. So, uh, again, uh, the. I was talking about the IMX8 with the uh, Yocto Linux. Uh, it's not available from NXP, but I have some customers that installed the preempt uh, RT patch on Yocto Linux and got the low latency performance out of it. And then they, they were using Linux on all and every single core. The Linux is uh, the advantage of having Linux at least in one of the cores is because let's say you're connecting this to a computer. You can use the drivers like the audio class drivers present on Linux. You want to connect anything to uh, any peripherals to your platform. Uh, you you, you take advantage of the drivers that are out there instead of ha having to write your own. So I, I think I answered your question, but if not, uh, we can we can follow up that later. Thank you. A question for Eduardo. A couple of folks are asking when the IMX eleven seventy will be available and what is the EVK associated with it? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so we've been working with several customers already to date, but we just uh, are now getting ready for the launch phase. So the plan right now is to um, bring to the market the consumer version in uh, November timeframe and to bring the industrial and automotive uh, version in February of 2021. So coming soon. Fantastic. A question for you, Marcelo. For the FFTW library that has Neon support, is performance expected to be similar or better than a DSP running FFT slash FIR on ARM Cortex A9, like an IMX6 dual device? On the IMX, on the A9, okay, so so can you read that again? So the FFT library is available for the A cores, and I guess he's talking about the uh, this one, the NE10. Uh, is it better than what? Is it is performance expected to be similar or better than a DSP running FFT slash FIR on an mm -hmm. ARM Cortex A9? On the Cortex A9. Okay, so I I don't know about the A9, but let's uh, I'm guessing you're asking about FT, FFT performance on the A cores over a DSP. Of course, the DSP is going to be better uh, in terms of uh, performance per clock cycle. Okay, because it has FFT accelerator, so it has a special instruction to do the FFT operation for you, and that's why DSPs uh, are used or, or were used for many years because they had these special instructions. And what you can do is use the FFT library, which is going to be using some other neon instructions or uh, ARM core instructions, and then doing the same calculation for you. It's going to take more clock cycles, okay? But the thing is, this is running at 450 megahertz. This is running at 1.5 and go to 1.8 and 2.2. So in terms of uh, time, Yes, the ARMS pro, ARM processors are going to be better in terms of a per cycle. If you just want to do things in a short uh, clock cycles, then the shark will be better. But again, that comes with the cost and you're stuck again with that architecture. So I hope that answered your question. And about the A9, I don't know, like the A9 probably is going to have uh, some performance in between the A53 and maybe the, A, the M7. So something in between this for FFTs and FIRs. So I hope I answered your question, but you know we can we can talk about that later if you want. Absolutely. So we are out of time, and there are a bunch of questions we weren't able to get to. 
So I'll forward them over to you, Marcelo and Eduardo, so you can reach out to these folks directly. Okay. Yeah, happy to address those for sure. Okay. Right, with that, thank you so much for presenting. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate it. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Thanks. The webinar is now ending. Bye.